All right. Give it up for our worship team. Sue's going to stay up here. Colin, thank you so much. Colin's been going since vision. Well, we went ba way back when we were youth and young adults. This dude was playing guitar in a barn with us. Give it up for Colin. He's been such a good friend to have. So much fun. Always give me good music recommendations. But, man, you guys have blessed me so much. Again, if this is your first time, thanks for coming out. We're usually in a series right now, and we've been in a series called Sermon on the Mount. It's been very encouraging to me. I don't know if it's been encouraging to you, but it's been very encouraging to me. And uh, we're going to venture off of Sermon on the Mount specifically for our birthday. I believe God's put a message in my heart. And if you're new to church, there's this word that I believe in that's in Scripture. And there's this word called prophecy. And the word prophecy just means God sometimes puts a word that's Scripture from his Scripture that encourages the church for a now word. It's timely. And I think, I believe, I don't think, I believe God dumped something in my heart for our church and what he wants to accomplish and do through us for anyone who's willing to just listen. As Jesus said, he who, had, he who has ears, let them hear. And, uh, and so I'm excited to bring you a word that's away from Sermon on the Mount um, that might tie in a couple of the things, but just something that I've been uh, thinking about this week with our fifth uh, birthday and just what God has done. But I, I'm a firm believer in celebrating what God has done, but also not getting too comfortable that we don't continue to take ground for the kingdom of God. Uh, and that's always been our church. We've always taken more ground. We've always moved forward because there's people who need Jesus, and we don't stop. Um, and I, as long as one, one person in our county doesn't know who Jesus is, we will never, ever stop. Um, and that's our heart here at our church. So we're going to be in an Old Testament book called Haggai. Everyone said Haggai. People say Haggai. Hey, guy. Uh, you can say Haggai. Uh, Haggai 2. I'm going to start, I'm actually going to start in verse 14, Bobby. I know I gave you 10. I'm just going to start in verse 14 for the sake of time. I really want to uh, focus on this. Haggai 2, starting in verse 14. This is what it says. Then Haggai responded, that is how it is with his people and this nation, says the Lord. Everything they do and everything they offer is defiled by their sin. Look at what was happening to you before you began to lay the foundation of the Lord's temple. When you hoped for 20 bushel crop, you harvested only 10. When you expected to draw 50 gallons from the wine press, you found only 20. I sent blight and mildew and hail to destroy everything you worked so hard to produce. Even so, you refused to return to me, says the Lord. Haggai is speaking for God to his people. And some people are like, God did that to them. Uh, but if you actually look at what he says, he said, even so, you refused to return to me. I think a lot of times in our lives, God is doing some things. Sometimes our finances dry up. Sometimes we can't explain things because God is actually trying to get our heart back to him. I'm not talking about sickness. I'm not talking about disease. I'm talking about some circumstances that have happened in your life that you're wondering what is going on. He said, this is an opportunity to return to me. And that's what he said. But even so, you refuse. But I love this. Verse 18. Think about this. 18th day of December. I thought it was fitting since tomorrow is December 18th that, that we're just going to declare this today that on the 18th day of December, the day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, think carefully. I am giving you a promise now while the seed is still in the barn. You have not yet harvested your grain and your grapevines, fig trees, pomegranates, and olive trees have not yet produced their crops. But from this day, everyone say this day. You got to help me this morning. From this day. If you're excited that we've been around for five years, say this day. From this day onward, I will bless you. Who's grateful for a God who actually wants to bless his children? That he doesn't want to see us suffer. He doesn't want to see us just get by. He wants to bless us. Not only has he given us Jesus Christ, but he wants to bless us on word. Lord, I just pray right now that you would bless this moment. Lord, I pray that you would speak this to us as you spoke it to me. I believe this is a now word for us today. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Find a couple people and tell them the title of this message. Say, what's in your seed? What's in your seed? What's in your seed? Now, before I jump right into what I want to do, I have to lay some foundation for you. I have to lay some groundwork. So please, if you miss this, you miss it all. Because this is very important of what's happening. I love telling you the context of the story so you can understand what's happening at this time. Haggai was, wrote, was written in the Old Testament before Jesus came. There was prophecies and there was uh, words that came that said Jesus was coming, the ultimate Savior. 
But in the Old Testament, the Israelites, or God's people, were walking along, and he was taking care of them. He was providing for them. But just like you and I, they would continue to turn their backs, or they would refuse, or they would complain. I know that we still find ourselves in that place. But the Israelites were doing that. And Haggai is at the end of the Old Testament, and he was a prophet. A prophet was someone that was called by God to declare to his people what God wanted to speak. And what Haggai is saying at this moment is he's saying, remember before the foundation was laid. Now let me build this up because we hear about this temple. Uh, In this time, the temple of God, which resembled the promise and the presence of God, uh, was torn down. It was actually a very depressing thing to see. God's people would walk right by it, and they would be heartbroken because it was torn down, because that showed not just was the physical temple torn down, the presence of God, but it was actually a reminder to them what their spiritual state looked like. I don't know about you, but have you ever felt like maybe your spiritual state looks like that ruined building that's laying on the ground? So they would just continue on with their life, and in the scripture we see, um, again, I'm just giving you some context, we see that they were actually building their own houses, yet the temple remained ruined. So Haggai comes in and says, listen, you spent so much time building your own house. What about the Lord's house? And I think we need to ask ourselves this question as a church. As we celebrate five years, I'm thankful for people in my living room who said, you know what? I've spent this much time building my house, but from now on, God has called me to build his house in Pontiac, Illinois. And all of us now get to be a part of what they have built because they said, there's some ruins in Pontiac, Illinois, but I'm done building my house and my fame I'm going to build. And so Haggai comes in and says, all your things are built down. Can you guys hear me? I got a new mic. Does this sound good? Can you guys hear me? I'm, it's different to me, so I'm trying to get used to it. Uh, so he comes in. He says, um, your houses are being built, but the Lord's temple has remained in shambles. And so in the scripture, he says, remember what it was like before the Lord's temple was built. It said that you would harvest 20 bushels, but you'd only get 10. He said you were looking for blessing, but you never found it. But then, we're going to look back real fast, in verse 18, he says, think about the 18th day of December, which is tomorrow, which we can celebrate today. The day when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Think carefully. I am giving you a promise now. So before we go on and say, I want to be blessed by God, I want to be blessed onward, Haggai says, think about the 18th day of December, now when the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. He said, these people heard the challenge. They heard Haggai's words. They heard the word of God. They said, we have got to stop building our own house, and we have got to start building the temple again. And as the foundation went down, he says, now that the foundation is down, I want to give you a promise now. While the seed's still in the barn, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you. You see, guys, this is a picture of what it means to put Christ first. This is what it means to put Christ first. Before we get anywhere, we have got to put this down. We have to nail this down before I go any further because if I preach this whole message and you don't put Christ first, you're not going to be blessed. You're not going to experience everything he has for you. You may get cash money. You may get good relationships. You may have your business successful. But if you don't have Christ, you don't have anything. And so if we don't get this, you're going to find out at the end of life, even though you spent your whole life building your own temple, at the end of life, building his temple was the most rewarding thing you could ever do. And he says that we are that temple in the New Testament, that we are the living stones that build his temple, that he would call us. He has put his Holy Spirit in us, meaning we are now a temple of God. Wow. He says, build your life upon it. Build your life upon it. Now, let's talk about foundation really fast, because let's be honest, foundation is anything but sexy. Right? Like, no one's walked by like, did you see the foundation of that building? Woo! No one says it. Like when Portillo's was going up in Bloomington, you drove by for months wondering when the walls were going to go up. But what you didn't know is that they were going down first. You drove by and saw nothing. You drove by and saw nothing. And you dreamed about those Chicago dogs. You dreamed about that beef. You dreamed about those french fries. And finally when that first wall went up, you're like, now that's sexy. That's what I'm looking at. That's looking good. Now don't look at me weird because we, we idolize these things that don't make sense, right? Like we idolize like, we make so, uh, we idolize the, the outcome of it. We always, idol, uh, um, we always focus on what's going to happen, but we don't focus on the action that's going to happen, right? Like, we'll be so quick to, to treat someone like garbage, but we don't, we don't care about the foundation. We just care about what the fruit. But you can't have the fruit without the foundation. You can't have it. 
And so it's not very good, but hey, guys, stop some. The, the temple's not even built yet. Nothing has gone up. I'm, I'm ready for this. Nothing has gone up. And he says, now that the foundation has been laid, I love that our God sees repentance and devotion just when the foundation has been laid. The building's not even up yet, but he says, oh, their hearts are in the right place. They don't have to build the whole thing up as long as they get the foundation down. If you're here today and you've been building your own temple, he's not waiting for you to build a whole building. He's just waiting for you to turn away from everything you're doing and say, you know what? Upon Christ the solid rock I stand, all other else is sinking sand. You want to be blessed? It's time to turn your devotion. It's time. You've been coming now for week in and week out, and it's fun. They give good vibes, the cool lights, and everything like this. If this is your first time here, just sit back and enjoy. But if you're here saying, man, I want to be a believer of Christ, you can't. You can't leave the temple in shambles and expect God, expect God to bless you. Here's the truth about foundation. You're only as strong as your foundation. And even though you may have big pockets, when the money leaves, the house will go down too. You see, the big thing that Christ wants us to know, hey, guys, saying, now that the foundation has been laid. I love that he didn't wait. He said, look it, this symbol of the foundation being laid is a symbol of God's people turning back to him. And I just want to speak into our town right now. I believe the last five years, what you've witnessed in Pontiac is the temple being laid. I believe people are beginning to listen. What is happening at that church? I begin, people are beginning to rise up. God is looking at Pontiac no longer as a place of people who are just doing their own thing, but we have seen so many people give their hearts to Christ, begin to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. He's saying, now that the temple has been laid, think carefully, I'm going to bless you onward. So before you take another step, I just want to ask you, who's your foundation? I love what Paul said. I don't have this, but Paul said this in 1 Corinthians. He said, because of God's grace, I have laid the foundation like an expert builder. Now others are building on it, but whoever is building on this foundation must be very careful. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, Jesus Christ. What's our foundation? What's our foundation? It can't be your grandma's God. It can't be your family's God. Well, they've been in church their entire life. No, 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 no. It's time for you to start building and saying, Jesus, my heart has been far from you, but you know what? You're the only thing I can stand upon. And we got to declare that today as a church that we will be on that, which means if you're going to say he's your foundation, then not only do we need to look like Jesus, but we need to be a part of what Jesus was a part, to go into all the world, preaching the gospel, baptizing the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what we're called to do. That's how we build the house. And so as we've talked about that, I want to now kind of make it a little bit more lighthearted because I know I just want to start out with that. But I want to show you some awkward family photos because you guys have been sending me so many photos. I love it. They're not awkward. They're great. The fam the Thank you for the Christmas photos you send. They're all in the refrigerator. We have no more refrigerator. But I love awkwardness, and nothing is more awkward than family photos that are awkward. So I thought I'd bring you a couple and explain why I'm showing you things. But this is one of my favorite ones. I'm going to show you this first one right here. This is an awkward family photo. Am I the only one who thinks it's that? There's like three of us. Like, some of you are like, gosh, scratch that idea this Christmas. Like, some of you are like serious about it. Look at the denim. Like, that is awesome. Okay. Hey, this is personally my favorite. If anyone loves pugs, if you're a dog lover, <laughs> look at that pose. This is prime right here. Uh, what about this one? You know, when you're taking the photo and it's like, whoops. Some of you who don't have kids aren't laughing. Wait till you have kids and you poke them in the eye. You drop them. You hit them in the head with a George Foreman. It really happened. Don't ask about it. <laughs> Whoops. Look at, the guy, look at the dad's face. Like, uh, was it my job or was that your job? <laughs> was I supposed to have her? So there's some awkward family photos. This next one's not too awkward, but I want to show you it just for the sake of, this is my family. Look at that family. They're beautiful, especially the guy on the right who just graduated Fire Academy. Congratulations, Caleb. We love our first responders, and, uh, and so this is our family, and they're like, Sean, that's not really awkward. I'm going to make it awkward. Because you look at all the grandkids, you look at all the kids, you look at the whole family, and you realize, next picture, that it all started with these two. 
I mean, oh, but come on, that's kind of funny too, right? My mom, my, my wife says, oh, your mom looks like little Bo Peep in a good way. But if you go back, if you go back to the other picture, just realize that in the twinkle of the eye, right, here's where it gets awkward, that just a seed, it's awkward for me, guys, it's awkward for me, <laughs> would start all that. Isn't it crazy that it all started with a seed? Isn't it crazy? We don't talk about the foundation, we don't talk about the seed, but with a seed, this huge thing can come from it. That not just that, if you go to the next picture again, the, the, the marriage picture, that is my dad's grandma. So really, if you want to get really crazy, it started with her. Well, you know. And as we continue to look at this, I am now preaching the gospel to a church on top of a stage that was first a tree that first was sprouted from a... The house you live in is wood that was cut down from a tree that was eventually first started from a seed, but no one talks about the seed. No one talks about the seed. We want to see the stage. We want to see what the seed has to offer. But in the scripture, God specifically says to Haggai, he says, now that the temple has been laid, he says this in verse 18 and 19. Verse 19, I am giving you a promise now while the seed is still in the barn. You have not yet harvested your grain and your grapevines, fig trees, and pomegranates. But from this day onward, I will bless you. So what do we do when God gives us a promise, yet the seed is still in the barn? What do we do when God says, this is something I want to do through you, through your family, through your prodigal kid, the one who ran away from Christ. This is what I want to do, yet you have no proof. You see, I think God is, is a professional in giving us promises before we have the evidence. And he says, I'm going to give you a promise right now, before you even plant the seed in the ground. It's still in the barn. I'm going to bless you. Of course he's going to do that because it takes faith. But I believe he's done the same for us, that each one of us has a seed that God has given us. Now, that can be Christianese. You, someone might say, just plant the seed. And you're like, what are they talking about? Just, just laugh at them and go find someone who can explain it to you. <laughs> like, just plant it. No, don't laugh. Just go, mm-hmm. Just plant the seed. We're planting seed. That's a, a, ch a churchy word that we use. What that means is this. God has given you something that you need to be obedient with. That's what he's saying. Whatever God has given to you and what he's asking you to do through the word is seed that you are supposed to do. Every week I am throwing out seed from God's word that he's putting in your hands to do something with. And he says, I'm giving you a promise while the seed you have is not even in the ground yet. Guys, this is our God that he would actually believe that he's going to do some stuff that you can't see and yet all you see is a seed in the barn. And I want us today to say what is in your seed the only way to find out what's in your seed is to plant it only way the only way to find out what God has given you is to plant it three things real fast the first thing I want to talk about this if you want to find out what's in your seed if God wants to bless you what God wants you to see is in your seed what God wants you to see is in your seed you see God comes in he says I'm giving you a promise right now the seed's in the barn, the promise is in front of you, and you're right here. I don't know about you guys, but even to this day, I know God's put some promises in my heart that I don't have proof yet, and sometimes it's so hard to hang on to those things. Let's just be real. I want to give up. And he says, the seed's in the barn, but I'm going to give you a promise right now. Before you have evidence, before you have proof, before you can see anything, you have a promise. And guys, we have to stop living for feelings and stop living for proof when we have a promise. The promise of God is what he wants us to live by because living by the promises of God is living by faith. Living by proof is living by what we see. We walk by faith and not by sight. So we have to live by the promises of God. But if we look through here, I think the church does a really good job talking about the promises of God, and we should because he never fails. He's unfailing. He is faithful. And we need to talk about the promises of God. But we forget about the seeds of God. He gave the Israelites two things in the story. He says, I'm giving you a promise while the seed's in the barn. So he's given them a promise, and he's given them seed. We don't talk about the seed. We talk about the promise. We wait for the promises of God to come into fruition in our life, and sometimes we're waiting because we've planted the seed, and it takes time for a seed to grow, and sometimes we're waiting on the promises of God because we left the seed in the barn. Let me say that again. We've left the seed in the barn. He gave them a promise, but he didn't say, now don't plant it. 
He's like, no, you, you got to plant it. It's just that I'm going to make it fruitful. What God wants you to see is in your seed. Let me say it this way. The promises of God in your life are found in the produce of seeds in your barn. The promises of God in your life that he wants to do in your life are found in the produce, the fruit of the seeds that are in your barn. Let me make it very simple for you. Your need is in your seed. Their provision, your supply, the thing that you've been waiting for and asking God for, what if he didn't give you the need, but he gave you a seed to get to that need? We just want him to drop something in our hands, but he says, I've given you a promise, but I've also given you the seed. If you want to reap the harvest that I have for you, you've got to take the seed out of the barn, you've got to put it in the ground, you've got to water it, and then you've got to harvest it. You can't just hold on to the promise, you've also got to do something with the seed. Could it be that the main reason why we're missing out on the promises of God is because we left the seed in the barn? We just wait. He says, I'm waiting on you. Jesus said it is finished, meaning it's your move, church. I did everything. It is finished. It is complete. I've done everything. Take your authority. Take what you're supposed to believe. Take everything that I have given you and walk it out. Quit waiting on God. Get the seed out of the barn and start planting it and watch him produce a harvest that you're waiting for. He said it's finished. Now do it. It's finished. There's your promise. There's your promise. But don't forget about the seed. 2 Corinthians 9.10 says, For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer. What if he provided you a seed and then the bread to eat in the same way he will provide and increase your resource and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you? Guys, we're waiting so many times for the promises of God. He says, I provide the seed for the farm. We don't don't preach a lot about this. We preach about the promises and that's it. But what if your promises are the fruit of the seed God's asked you to do something with? If we preach promises without seed, then what we're preaching is a faith without action. That's what it is. Because all the blessings I have seen in my life are when I say, God, thank you for giving me this. I'm going to put it in the ground and see what you do with it. Obedient. Not to get God to love me, but because he did everything for me. He gave you a promise. He gave you. So let me show you how this works. Isaiah 26.3, it's not even going with this but it is going to help you understand that God doesn't just give you a promise, he gives you a seed. This is all throughout scripture. He gives the scripture uh, all throughout here. He gives us promises that we bank on and we quote them. We put them on coffee mugs. We preach them. We say them. I've done it. We've all done it. And we should speak them. We should speak promises of God in our life. I'm not saying don't do that. I am saying that don't forget that with every promise is a seed. Let me show you. Isaiah 26. You will keep in perfect peace. Promise. You will keep in perfect, you're looking for peace this Christmas season? I know I am because my Christmas bill went a little bit higher than I thought. Come on, Amazon, right? Like, good thing I didn't have to pay for shipping. You will keep in perfect peace those minds who are stayed steadfast upon Christ because they trust in you. Seed. Seed. Some of you are looking for the, God said he wants to give me peace, but you got to stop watching Fox News three hours every single morning and get your face in the word. Seed. I'm, yeah, this is going to help some people. I'm looking for joy. You're not going to find joy by surrounding yourself and staying put on the things that aren't bringing joy. He says those who want perfect peace will keep their eyes focused on God, on his word, on his promises. If you want to see the promises, you got to plant the seed. You want to see joy in your life? You got to plant the seed. I, I just want to say that God has given you promises, right? We, pro, uh, we do this all the time. Jeremiah 29, 11. You ask anyone their favorite verse, I love Jeremiah 29, 11. Why? Because God wants to give me hope. He, wants to, he doesn't have plans to harm me, but to give me hope in the future. Praise God. But if you keep reading, if you keep reading, he says, those who seek me with their whole heart, they will find me. You know why maybe your plans are being futile and they're not working and they're harming you? Because you forgot the seed part. You're supposed to be seeking him with your whole heart. You're looking for a life that will give you hope in the future. you got to put him as the foundation. I don't know. I just believe in Christ and I don't understand what's going on. Because you took the promise but you left the seed in the barn. Or you took the promise and you left the seed on the nightstand. I can throw that Bible around because it's already broken. Because... Show me a Bible that's falling apart, and I'll show you a Christian whose life isn't, right? Amen. 
Guys, I don't want this to be too strong. My heart as a pastor is to say I'm tired of people holding on to the promises of God, yet they're sitting on their their chair and their recliner, and they're doing nothing with it. If you want to see that God is faithful, you have got to step out when you're scared. You've got to step out when you're worried. You've got to step out and say, what is in my seed? What Christ wants you to see is in your seed. Seed, and you'll never experience it if it stays in the barn. You'll never experience it if it stays in there. And the more you see what happens when you plant that, you'll realize that God does have plans to help you. He has plans not to harm you, but to give you hope in the future. You'll see it. It's a promise. I'm, I love that verse. But I also love the fact that he tells me to seek him with his whole heart. I love it. Another thing, too, if you want to see what's in the seed, oh, I got to talk about this. I have to. I got to. This is going to be good. We went to a conference in, Oct- in uh, September. We went to Nashville. We took the team there, and it was mind-blowing. We just got hammered with the Holy Spirit, just listening to what he wanted to speak for us in our church. And we went there, and they have merch. I'm a merch guy. I like fashion. I like clothes. Don't, I don't care uh, what people say about my fashion. We, I know we jab and stuff. It's fun. Like, don't ever feel bad doing that. It's a good time. Uh, but I do dress better than you. So, uh, so I love going and looking at merch stuff, merchandise at different churches. And they had these cool hats that said the belonging company, which I wear like every day. If you see me, I wear it all the time. And I went there, and we were kind of low on cash. And as I was looking with my wife, I picked a head up. I was like, this thing is awesome, but it was 35 bucks, right? I was like, this thing's awesome, but I got two kids, right? You know what I'm saying? And one's at Noah's Ark. And uh, I, I literally, I believe we should pray not just for ourselves, but I believe, yes, God wants to take care of the orphans and the widows, and he wants to take care of poverty. But I also believe God takes care of little needs, too. He's big enough to do all of it. He's big enough to handle your prayers, even if it's ridiculous. So I said, God, I literally don't have money. I love what God is doing here. I really want this hat. And I looked at Liz. I'm like, I feel dirty even praying that. Because that's just not my personality. I'm like, but God, I, I really want this hat. And I put it back. I don't know why. I just prayed it. I went during one of the sessions, there was worship, and they were worshiping, and this dude and his wife sat next to me. He was like 6'4", had a really cool handlebar mustache. I, I was very jealous. And, uh, and during that time, they're from a, a, like a Baptist background, not bashing Baptist background, but it was kind of new to them because it was a very kind of like church how we do it and stuff. And so they were just, just inc- being so encouraged. And so I felt like God said, I want you to grab that man and speak this into his heart. What if I'm wrong? But he says, Sean, I've given you a seed, <clears throat> and you need to be obedient. <clears throat> so I said, hey, man, I don't know if this means anything, but you've dropped something, you've let it down, and you need to pick it back up. He instantly started crying. And his wife and him, they grabbed me right after and Matt Woodman and a couple other people, and they said, we don't know what this Holy Spirit thing is. We love what God is doing. We see it's working, and we want to be used by God. What, what does it mean? So I got to explain how you can uh, receive the Holy Spirit, which we believe at our church. And we're like, if you want it, we'll pray over you right now in the middle of everyone. We don't care. They won't care. Let's just do it. And they said, please do it. So we just prayed and said, God, would you just fill them with your Holy Spirit? And instantly, they're like, we don't really feel anything. I'm like, it's okay, but you'll know. And as soon as he asks you to do something, do it. So another day goes by. We go back to the next session. I keep running into him. Hey, how are you doing? Whatever. I'm going to the bathroom, too much information, I know. I'm going to the bathroom, I come out, as I come out of the bathroom, I hear, hey, Sean, his name's Caleb. I'm like, what's up? And he's like, this tall, what's, what's up? And uh, he's like, he's, got, he's going like this. I'm like, yeah, what's going on? He goes, hey, because uh, he had one of those cool hats that I love, and I always told him about it. He goes, hey, I got you something. And it was the hat. And I looked at him, I said, you want to know how the Holy Spirit's working in you? I prayed for that hat yesterday. It wasn't even about the hat, guys. It was about what is in your seed. If you will just be obedient in what it is, your need, the hat, was me being obedient to pray over Caleb. But some of you don't pray over Caleb, and you're wondering what your provision is. You weren't obedient. But trust me, when you're obedient, I will bless you onward. Church, when God asks us to go, we're going to go. When God asks us to speak, we're going to speak. When God asks us to heal, we're going to heal. Why? So we can be blessed onward. Our need is in the seed. We got to be obedient. Oh, number two, stop counting your seed and start planting your seed. You want to see what's in your seed? Stop counting your seed and start planting your seed. A lot of times what we do 
is we look at the seed that's in the barn, and it looks so small and insignificant. It's such a little thing. It really is. And as we look at that seed, we realize that there's nothing kind of to it. And so I think that's what happens is we say, God, I know you've given me this talent. I know you've given me this gift. I know you've given me this amount of money. But this is so small. This, the seed that you want me to plant, me praying for Caleb, that's really not that big of a deal. I want to see a revival in Pontiac. What, what is a little, what is this going to, what? And what we do is we actually judge what God wants to do through us by this little tiny seed. And we got this app, right? We look at the apple. The apple is tasty. We don't even think about the seed in it. But if I were to throw this to you and say, how many seeds are in the apple? You would cut it, yeah. you would cut it up and you would say, three. Yeah, sure, three. But if I were to give you a seed and say, how many apples are in the seed? You couldn't tell me. But I know one person who could tell me. His name is God. And God has asked you to do something, and you're focused on the seed. He says, no, 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 no. Stop cowing the seed and start planting the seed because you have no many ideas. This one seed will create an apple tree. On the apple tree will be more apples. And in those apples will be more seeds, which could create more trees and more apples and more trees and more apples. Guys, I'm here to tell you. Billy Graham went to a tent revival on the third day because God asked a man to have a tent revival, and no one showed up the first day, and he preached a message. And he went back, and no one showed up, and he preached a message. And he went back, and he preached a message. And at that moment, one boy walks in, and he leads him to Christ, and his name was Billy Graham. Now, if you don't know who Billy Graham is, Millions of people in stadiums hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ, coming to Christ. Why? Because one man said, I will plant the seed and be obedient. Even though what I don't look like is evidence and proof, I will be obedient. Because I don't know what's in Billy Graham, but God did. And it affected people. That person that God's asked you to reach at Walmart, you have no idea who that person could be. Just be obedient. Just take care of the seed. Quit counting the seed. Start planting it. Start planting it. Jesus said this and John, he said, Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. I could preach so much about this. What Jesus was saying was he was going to die. He was going to die, and when he dies, it was going to bring life, meaning you and I. So when Christ died, the seed fell into the ground, and three days later he came up. It reaped a harvest that we are now seeing today because of the life of Christ. But if you look at this, he's saying, though the single seed, it produces many seeds. And maybe you're in a season where you are dug down deep in isolation and darkness, and he's saying sometimes the seed has to die for it to produce more. There's some things in your life that the Holy Spirit's asking you to give up because you know it does not glorify God. Our goal in life, I love this, our goal in life is not to be happy, it's to be holy. Does God want us happy? Of course he does. Actually, happiness is tied to holiness. It just takes faith to get there. And he says, there's some things in your life that I'm asking you to give up. Some seed needs to die so I can produce life in you. You want to see life in your marriage? You're going to have to stop talking to that other lady, sir. You want to see your, you want to see your marriage thrive? You're going to have to actually start listening to her and put the phone somewhere else. Some things have to die so you can produce more life. Jesus said, I'm going to go into the ground, quit looking at the seed. And guys, as I, I'm trying to communicate all this. As I look at five years, I'm so thankful that I didn't look at all my weaknesses. I did, but I'm grateful for people, parents, grandparents, Jim and Sue, people who walked alongside of me, Mueller's, um, there's a lot of people in that time, who said, don't give up. God has called you to do this. My wife, of course. And I look back now, and I was just looking through pictures, getting ready for this weekend, and I, I saw a picture of me and my brother coming up out of the water, holding each other, because he just got baptized. I had no idea that that was in my seed, but the only way for me to witness it was to plant it. And some of you are missing out on some of the biggest blessings God has for you because the seed is still in the barn. Don't close your barn door. Guys, it's there. I know it's scary. I know it's tough. I know obedience is hard. 
but your need is in your seed, your supply, your provision. It's there. And this is the word from the Lord today. He's saying, I want to bless you onward. Get the foundation set. And the, even though the seed is still in the barn, I'm giving you a promise. I look around and I see marriage is restored. I, I look around and I see what God is doing. Who knew that that was not just in my seed, but people who gave, people who served. So if you're here today and you've served or you've given anything, just know that everything you're witnessing was in your seed. Your obedience, I want to say thank you. Happy five years. There's nothing more beneficial than seeing what we saw a couple weeks ago when people made the decision to get baptized. Why? Because people said, I'm not going to sit back and count my seed. I'm going to do something with it. That's what it means to be a life full of faith. A life following Christ is that we would be people who continue to move forward. Stop counting your seed and start planting it. We'll never know what it looks like until we plant it. And the last thing is this. Don't let disappointment close your barn door. Don't let disappointment close your barn door. I want to look back real fast in verse 15 and 17. Haggai 2, verse 15. This is what, this is what Haggai says before he blesses them. He says, look at what was happening to you before you began to lay the foundation of the Lord's temple. When you hoped for 20 bushel crop, you harvested only 10. When you expected to draw 50 gallons from the wine press, you found only 20. I sent blight and mildew and hail. Even so, you refused to return to me, says the Lord. Right? Have you ever been obedient, expecting 20 bushels, but only getting 10? I don't think there's anything more discouraging than, than stepping out, believing that God had that for you, and then the return is not what you were expecting. That's disappointment. If we were honest with ourselves, I don't care who is in here today, church people, non-church people, we've all been through disappointment in our life. And our God cares about our disappointment. He really does. Now, in this case, their disappointment because their devotion was not towards God. So my first question would be this. Maybe go home tonight and say, God, see if there's any offensive way in me. See if there's anything that my devotion isn't to you. This year, guys, God has, it's been one of the hardest years for Liz and I, but it's been one of the most beneficial years for Liz and I. Because as we planted this thing, God <laughs> blew this thing up. We couldn't even, it was like Godspeed. We're like, what is going on? I don't know. Let's just keep going. And sure enough, my heart began to get focused on other things. Comparing other churches. And my heart began to shift even though I didn't notice. And it's crazy how God will begin to take some things away in your life. To where to remind you, why are you doing this in the first place, Sean? And I believe that this year has been a moment for where I've said, you know what? I stopped working on the foundation, and I was working on my own thing. But praise God that he allowed some things in my life not to have fruit so I could get my heart focused back on God. Some of the best things God has done for me is not giving me what I asked for to remind me that I was more after the gift than not the giver. So I turn. And today, you got to make that choice too. But maybe you went through disappointment. And my encouragement is the barn door in your life is closed. You said, Sean, I already tried forgiving that person. Sean, I've already tried to make this thing work. Sean, I've already given for two weeks, right? Sean, I've been at church for three weeks and nothing has changed. First off, if you go to the gym for just three weeks looking for results, you are going to be hugely disappointed. We come to church and think, I came for one week. You spent 40 years messing up your life. You're going to give God one week? <laughs> Come on! That's not faith. That's just saying, hey, God. Faith is not just stepping out. Faith is staying out. And so when we look, your barn door's been closed because of disappointment. Guys, I've been there. I've been there too much. And if you are disappointed today, the word of the Lord, honestly, today is for you, is don't let disappointment close your door. It's time to open up your barn doors again. A few years ago, the fields got around here got you, worst thing you come up. The fields were so drowned out. They got so uh, wet that my, my cousin is a farmer. We have some farmers in here. And I was talking to them. They said, Sean, it's a really tough year uh, because there's so much rain. And one year there was like no rain. And as the, the fields, you would drive by the fields and think it was a pond because there was so much water. That year, they did not yield that much crop. And for a farmer, that's hard because that's their, that's their money. That's their provision. They have to budget off that. And so that can be tough for them as they go out and farm. Do you know what happened after that year? The next year, my cousin, Corey, who I get to see today, was, I was talking to him, and they're like, hey, how you doing? He goes, oh, we're doing good. In about another week, we're going back out in the fields. 
I'm like, but you had a bad year last year. Remember last year? Remember what happened? You didn't get what you wanted. You didn't yield the crop. Why don't you just get out of this business to go do something else? And I remember my cousin, his wife, said, you know what, last year wasn't very, wasn't a very good year for us. One thing God did show us was that we spent more complaining about the water in the field. And this year we're gonna start praying that God would take care of our crops. Because he took a bad year to remind us what we need to be focused on. And I don't know where you are. But maybe you had a bad year last year. Maybe 2017 wasn't your year. You're already looking at 2018 like, I hope it's a better year than this year. You know what? Who cares? As long as God is with you in it. Who cares? As long as Jesus is the foundation. But one thing I do know, he wants to bless you. Just because you had a bad 2017 doesn't mean you got to keep your darn door closed in 2018. Open that thing back up. There's breakthrough in those seeds. There's salvation in those seeds. There's loved ones in your family who need Jesus in those seeds. Your need is in that seat, but you got to open the barn door back up. What is God asking you? What is God asking you to do? Can I show you one more picture? I got two more, but I want to show you one more picture. Check out this picture. While the seed is still in the barn, this is our living room, 2012. A handful of people praying. God gave us a promise. I'm going to do something in Pontiac, Illinois that's going to blow your mind. But the seed was still in the barn. There's your seed right there. And because of their faithfulness, because they were giving, because they were serving, because they were having coffees, because they were praying and they were hugging and they did whatever it took to reach people, you are now sitting here. You know what that seed turned into? Look at this picture. Let alone, that's one experience. We got two. And so my question for you today, as I was sitting back there this week and praying, I said, Sean, this is the barn. You're the seed. What are we going to do with our seed, church? It's time for you to get on board. Don't just sit and say, I'm glad that they planted their seed. Yeah, they planted their seed so you could jump in and plant your seed too. Serve, give pray, forgive, whatever you need to do. What does it mean to plant seed? Be obedient. Get your word off the nightstand. Get in the group. Start a reading plan. Just do something that makes you uncomfortable, because chances are that's faith. Here's a seed, guys. It's in the barn. Two experiences. God has blessed us with. What can he do with this seed now? If he did that through a living room, what is he going to do through two experiences on a Sunday? We'll find out. We got to plant the seed. We got to plant the seed. Can I encourage you with this? Focus on the promise of obedience, not the pain of obedience. It's not just for you, it's for others. Focus on the promise of your obedience, not the pain of obedience. Because the promise far outweighs the pain and how hard it is to get there. If you're here today and you said, Sean, there's some things in my heart I know God's asking me to do. I just need some prayer for some courage to step out and do it. Would you just stand on your feet right now? Say, there's some seed in my barn that I have left the barn floors down. I've left my barn door closed. You can stand up right now. Say, today I want prayer. I'm standing up, so I guess if it's just me. Say, there's some things in my life I'm supposed to give, I'm supposed to serve, I was supposed to take care of, I was supposed to forgive. There's some seed in my barn I have gotten comfortable. I need to turn my devotion back to God. I need to lay the foundation, Jesus Christ, and only Him. God, bless me, bless my life. You said, there's some seed in my barn. I got to stand. Praise God. We're going to pray over you right now. Lord, we pray right now in Jesus' name for all the seed that is in here. We pray for those who've already planted it, but we pray for those who say, you know what, God is working in my heart right now. I pray, Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit that they would take a step of obedience. I know that other people and other friends may say you're crazy, you know what you're a part of, you even know what's going on, but Lord, there's one thing true, that your promises are always proven true. I pray that they wouldn't listen to the lies of the enemy, but they would listen to the, the, the truth of your word as they step out, that you will produce a harvest that's bigger than anything we imagine, and I pray that you will provide, that our biggest needs are in your seed, in our seed. I pray 
Father God, that we would lift you up when it's hard. I pray we would step out when we don't want to be obedient. I pray, Father God, that we would take our Bible off the nightstand and we would begin to dig into everything you have because, Lord, we don't want to get caught with our barn door closed. There's more people in our families. There's more people in our town. There's more people who need Jesus, and we can't sit by and watch them end their life without Christ. We have to do something. Help us be obedient, Holy Spirit. Help us. Lord, we thank you for everything you're doing in this place. We pray for those, Father God, who are coming back to Christ. If you're here, says, Sean, I need to turn my devotion to building the temple again. I need to make Christ number one. Could you lift up your hand right now? Say, I need to make Christ number one. I've been devoted to other things right now. Lord, do you hear of your people coming back? They're building the temple. They're coming back and saying, Jesus and only Jesus, the solid rock on which we stand. I pray, Father God, that they would have a moment with you. Right here, right now, if you want to make Jesus the foundation, no matter where you are, everyone repeat after me. Say, God, I need your son. Everything's shaking. But Jesus, he's a sure foundation. I will not be shaken. I'm standing on him today. Forgive me where I went wayward. I'm focused on you today. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's bless God for what he did today. Let's praise him for that word. Some of you are going to witness some seed in your life. It's going to be huge. Hey, before we go, we know it's five years and we have to celebrate. We're not going to leave without celebrating. I know it's 10, 19, who cares? We're going to go into one more song. We have some surprises for you. So let's stand up on our feet and let's have some fun declaring and celebrating everything God has done. Come on, right, church. church